Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm just going to give folks another one or two minutes to uh, settle in, and then we'll get started. All right, so since it's a couple of minutes after the hour, um, we are going to get started now. <clears throat> Thank you uh, to everyone for attending our webinar today about policies expanding access to healthcare for people living with HIV and hepatitis during the COVID-19 public health emergency. I'm Dori Malazanov. I'm a manager on the health systems integration team here at NASDAD. I'm joined by uh, Lisa Liu from JSI, who's going to talk about some resources that might be helpful during this time. And um, Amy Killalay and Tim Horn from NASDAD will also join us for the Q&A session at the end. Before I get started, um, I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. First, everyone should be muted by default as soon as they join. If you have any questions, please use the chat feature. We will have time for Q&A at the end, um, but feel free to send questions as they come to you and we'll address them later on. Uh, second, this webinar is going to be recorded. Slides and webinar recording will be available after the webinar. I'll send them uh, via email to all registrants within a couple of days. So with that, let's get started. So this webinar will cover state, federal, and insurer level policies expanding access to Medicaid, Medicare, and private insurance during the COVID-19 public health crisis. We will also discuss considerations for Ryan White, Part B, and ADAPS, including best practices, to adapt policies and procedures to ensure uninterrupted access to care. So let's start with Medicaid. Um, here's an overview of the policies that I'll talk about today. First, I'll talk about some federal policies that expand access to Medicaid, and then I'll discuss some policy options available to states. But before we get into policies, I just want to talk a little bit about why Medicaid in particular is so important in situations like the current COVID-19 public health emergency. Medicaid is a countercyclical program, meaning that enrollment and spending grow when there is a downturn in the economic cycle and vice versa. In general, data shows that since the passage of the ACA, people increasingly rely on Medicaid coverage when they're unemployed. Recent data from the Urban Institute estimates that anywhere from 25 to 43 million people are expected to lose employer coverage by the summer due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and that anywhere from 12 to 21 million people nationwide will be added to the Medicaid program. Although job losses will affect on insurance rates across the country, states that have not expanded Medicaid will likely see larger increases in uninsured rates. The Urban Institute estimates that in non-expansion states, about a third of people who lose their employer coverage will enroll in Medicaid, and another 40% will be uninsured. But in expansion states, Urban estimates that half of people who lose their coverage will enroll in Medicaid, while only a quarter will remain uninsured. Medicaid coverage already covers uh, roughly one in five low-wage workers and an another one in five lack insurance altogether. Many uninsured low-wage workers might be eligible for Medicaid or marketplace subsidies, but not enrolled, while many others fall into the coverage gap in states that have not expanded Medicaid. Additionally, nearly half of low-wage workers rely on employers for their insurance and may become eligible for Medicaid if they lose their jobs or their in incomes drop. 
Not surprisingly, data shows that low-wage workers are disproportionately more likely to experience job loss or income reductions during this crisis. And low-wage workers that do remain employed often work in essential businesses, like grocery stores and healthcare settings that put them at high risk for exposure. Low-wage workers disproportionately experienced financial hardship even before COVID-19, um, affecting their ability to afford not just healthcare, but other life necessities. Many also live in multi-generational households, which can increase risk. For these and many other reasons, a loss of income can have devastating impacts on low-wage workers and their families during the COVID-19 crisis, and Medicaid is a critical safety net for millions of people. Um, so the federal government um, has given states the option to receive enhanced federal Medicaid funding during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is important because for uh, the many reasons I just discussed, Medicaid enrollment is expected to reach unprecedented levels during COVID-19 due to workers who have lost their jobs and need coverage for themselves and other adults or children in their households. This is expected to put a significant strain on state budgets, so the enhanced federal match is something that we expect many states to benefit from. Many states have already seen unprecedented increases in their Medicaid applications since this crisis began, and those numbers are expected to increase in the coming weeks and months. Keep in mind that we don't know right now which states intend to pursue the increased federal funding, but many states have issued guidance outlining policies that are in place during the emergency, which might shed some light on whether they're pursuing this or not. You can contact your state Medicaid agency or check their website to ask about policies in place for your state. So now I'll talk about some requirements that are only applicable if the state is intending to seek the federal match, which we expect many states will. So if a state intends to seek the federal match, they must comply with these four requirements. First, they cannot disenroll anyone who's enrolled as of March 18th or anyone who enrolls after that date. This is especially important in states with policies like work requirements and premiums that can result in disenrollment for failure to comply. This also applies to anyone who's receiving Medicaid benefits pending an appeal. Even if the appeal is denied, they can't be disenrolled. Anyone who is um, involuntarily disenrolled from, Medicaid after, disenrolled from Medicaid after March 18th should contact their state Medicaid agency immediately uh, to request reinstatement of their coverage retroactive to the date of termination. Uh, like I said, there's no way to know right now which states are going to pursue the enhanced funding, but any state that intends to do so must reinstate coverage for anyone involuntarily disenrolled after March 18th. Medicaid can still proceed with conducting regular renewals and redeterminations during this time. Even if they can't be disenrolled, clients whose Medicaid coverage is up for redetermination or renewal are encouraged to complete their paperwork anyway in order to avoid dis disruptions in coverage after the emergency period ends. Even if the client's redetermination reflects a change in circumstances that would otherwise make them ineligible for Medicaid, for example, if their income goes up, states seeking the enhanced funding must continue providing coverage to them anyway. There is just one exception. Um, someone who moves out of state can be terminated from their Medicaid. So a client who moves out of state should apply for Medicaid in their new state. Even if they can't disenroll anyone, states can still act on reported changes in some ways. Uh, for example, by moving someone to a different eligibility category, but only if doing so does not result in a reduction of benefits. Number two, states can impose more restrictive eligibility requirements than those in place on January 1st. Since people can't be disenrolled for failing to comply with these requirements anyway, if the state is seeking the enhanced funding, this is mostly relevant for new enrollees. Some states require Medicaid applicants to demonstrate compliance with requirements, such as work requirements, before their coverage can even start. So to the extent that a state has such a policy, those requirements that new enrollees need to meet cannot be more restrictive than those in place on January 1st, assuming the state intends to seek the enhanced funding. Number three, states can impose new premiums or increase premiums. Again, most relevant for new enrollees, uh, some states require Medicaid applicants to pay their first premium before coverage can begin. Uh, number four, uh, states cannot impose cost sharing for COVID-19 treatment. This is not referring to testing. I'll cover that in a moment. These requirements uh, remain in effect until the end of the month in which the emergency period ends for states seeking the enhanced federal match. Note that the enhanced federal match and therefore all of these requirements do not apply to the Medicaid expansion group. This is because states already receive an enhanced match for this group under the ACA. 
Although only states seeking the enhanced federal match are required to cover COVID-19 treatment without cost sharing, all states are required to cover testing without cost sharing. This is true even if the state is not pursuing the enhanced federal funding. Uh, this includes the cost for the test itself and also testing related services. Uh, I'll refer to testing related services a number of times in this webinar. Uh, remember that this term is referring to the visit to a healthcare provider or a facility to evaluate the need for a COVID-19 test and also administer the test. It can include things like flu tests and blood tests to rule out other causes of illness. Testing related services only refers to services needed to evaluate the patient for the need for a COVID-19 test or to administer the test. Other services that might be provided in the same visit but that are not related to COVID-19 testing or evaluation are not included in this. Now let's get into some state policies. <clears throat> state plan amendments or SPAs are one way for states to make modifications to their Medicaid program. Depending on the type of change that a state wants to make, they may need to submit an SPA or a waiver, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And uh, here are some examples of states of changes that states can make with an SPA to expand coverage to more people, ease application processes and documentation requirements, eliminate enrollee costs like cost sharing and premiums, and increase provider payments during the emergency. To date, uh, 23 states and territories in total have received approval for COVID-19 related SPAs for Medicaid. A few states also have SPAs for their CHIP programs. Federal law addressing COVID-19 also allows states to temporarily expand limited Medicaid eligibility to all uninsured individuals, even if they're not otherwise eligible for Medicaid. This coverage is limited only to COVID-19 testing and the testing related services that I mentioned earlier. It does not include treatment. Uh, note that immigration related requirements for Medicaid eligibility are still in effect. So anyone who's ineligible for Medicaid due to their immigration status may not be included in this group. However, anyone else who's ineligible on the basis of their income being too high, for example, um, could still be included as being uninsured. Uninsured people includes anyone not enrolled in a federal health care program like Medicare or Medicaid, ACA compliant coverage, or insurance through their employer. Anyone enrolled in a non-ACA compliant product, such as short-term limited duration insurance, is also considered to be uninsured. Currently, eight states have received approval for an SPA to cover COVID-19 testing um, and related services for uninsured individuals. Several other states have begun the process but have not yet received approval. And the list of the eight states is there below. Eleven thirty-five waivers are another mechanism for states to make changes to their Medicaid program. Unlike 1115 waivers, which I'll talk about later, these waivers are only available during a declared public health emergency. Here are just a few ways that states can use 1135 waivers to expand access to Medicaid during COVID-19 by increasing access to medical providers, relaxing prior authorization um, in fee-for-service uh, programs, and making appeals more accessible. All 50 states, DC, and several territories have received approval for 1135 COVID-19 waivers. <clears throat> Section 1115 waivers might sound familiar to many of you. This authority is not new, but it's become very relevant in the last few years because states have been using it to implement policies like work requirements and premiums. Um, many states have also used this authority to expand access to substance use related care and treatment. So it can also be used for good things. States can also use 1115 waivers to make temporary changes to their Medicaid programs during an emergency like COVID-19. To date, only Washington has received approval for a COVID-19 related 1115 waiver, although several other states are currently in the process of submitting waiver requests. Washington's approved waiver uh, currently applies primarily to people receiving long-term services and supports. CMS rejected the state's proposal to increase Medicaid eligibility to 200% of the federal poverty level for the duration of the emergency and is still reviewing um, the state's request to uh, expand non-emergency medical transportation and to establish a disaster relief fund to cover COVID-19 treatment, housing, nutrition supports, and other things. These are just a few examples of the types of changes that states have proposed to make through 1115 waivers, but no others have yet been approved. Uh, 
Um, state level flexibilities. Uh, the SPAs and waivers that I've discussed so far all require federal approval before they can be implemented. However, states can adopt certain types of policies to expand Medicaid access during COVID-19 without seeking federal approval. For example, states can make changes to certain enrollment policies to facilitate quicker enrollment, relax prior authorization, relax um, in-network requirements for people enrolled in managed care plans, eliminate physician referral requirements, uh, and allow extended medication supplies and early refills. At least some state level policies have been implemented in every state and DC. You can check with your state's insurance department or Medicaid agency to learn what policies are in place in your state. Telehealth. Telehealth is something that I'm sure everyone has been hearing about and talking about a lot these days. Telehealth is a cost-effective alternative to providing traditional face-to-face -face medical care, and it's really important in an emergency like COVID-19 because it allows people to receive a wide range of services without having to travel to a healthcare facility so they can limit their risk of exposure and spread of COVID-19. Telehealth is beneficial not just for people affected directly by COVID-19, but it also enables social distancing for everyone who needs any kind of care. It also enables providers to triage patients when there's a high demand for care like there is right now. States have used state level policies to expand access to telehealth and Medicaid during the public health emergency by, for example, relaxing rules about the types of technology that may be used, i.e. video versus audio only, um, expanding the types of providers that can bill for telehealth services, eliminating cost sharing, and allowing initial establishment of a patient provider relationship via telehealth. Although 1135 waivers don't directly expand telehealth, states have used them to facilitate access to out-of-state Medicaid providers, which goes hand-in-hand -hand with telehealth access. But generally speaking, most uh, telehealth-related Medicaid policies can be implemented on the state level without federal approval. Massachusetts, shout out to Massachusetts, is an example of one state that has issued comprehensive guidance on a number of these policies in both fee-for-service and managed care Medicaid. Massachusetts has taken action to expand presumptive eligibility, expand telehealth, reimburse for patients that don't require inpatient care but who are quarantining in healthcare settings, allow 90-day medication supplies and early refills, and eliminate referral requirements for COVID-19 testing and treatment. Um, and here you can see some Massachusetts policies that affect people enrolled through managed care plans. They're, some of them are quite similar to the fee-for-service policies. Um, many state Medicaid agencies like Massachusetts have released bullets or guidance, bulletins or guidance like this that are available on their websites. So we encourage everyone to check their state Medicaid agency website often to learn about evolving policies in your state. <clears throat> Next up is Medicare. I'm going to talk about some Medicare policies that might be relevant to Ryan White clients. Um, Medicare is administered on the federal level, so this section is mainly focused on <clears throat> federal policies. First, let's talk about Medicare coverage of COVID-19 testing. COVID-19 testing is a preventive service, which means that it's covered without cost sharing under Medicare Part B and Medicare Advantage. This is true all year round. The COVID-19 testing related, testing related services um, are also covered without cost sharing. However, there is an important caveat here. The cost sharing is only eliminated for testing related services if a test for COVID-19 is actually administered. So if a provider determines that a COVID-19 test is not actually needed, the visit may still be subject to all usual Medicare cost sharing. Additionally, Medicare Advantage plans may not impose utilization and management like prior authorization for either COVID-19 testing or for testing related services. They can still impose utilization management for COVID-19 treatment though. Here are some prescription drug related Medicare protections that are also relevant for people living with HIV, trying to limit visits to the pharmacy in order to comply with social distancing. Medicare Part D plans, including Medicare Advantage plans that provide prescription drug coverage, must cover up to 90 day supplies of most medications during the COVID-19 crisis. Also, if an enrollee cannot reasonably obtain drugs from an in-network pharmacy for a reason related to the crisis, they can go to an out-of-network pharmacy. The plan must reimburse the pharmacy at the in-network rate 
but it's possible that an enrollee could have to pay some additional charges if they exercise this option, um, essentially like balance billing. Some examples of a situation where someone might need to access services out of network would be, uh, for example, an enrollee is outside of their party service plan area and they're prevented for re from returning for a disaster related reason. Uh, they're receiving, they receive a drug while they're an inpatient a patient in a hospital, in a clinic, or an outpatient setting. They need to fill a prescription in a timely manner, but they can't, uh, they don't live within a reasonable distance of a 24 hour pharmacy, or they need a drug um, that isn't regularly stocked at an accessible retail or mail order pharmacy. Plans also have the option to relax restrictions on early medication refills and home deliveries. This is optional, although covering up to 90 day supplies is required. Keep in mind that plans are not required to relax utilization management for drug coverage. Enrollees should contact their plan or their pharmacist to ask about policies that they might be able to take advantage of in order to safely access uh, prescription drugs during this emergency. Medicare Advantage plans are also required to allow enrollees affected by the crisis to access care from out-of-network facilities at in-network cost-sharing rates as long as those facilities participate in the Medicare program. Medicare Advantage plans also may still impose cost sharing and utilization management for COVID-19 treatments, even though, as I said before, they cannot do this for COVID-19 testing and test related services. Telehealth, um, although the Medicare program typically has a lot of restrictions on telehealth coverage, the federal government has relaxed some of these restrictions in order to allow Medicare enrollees to safely access services via telehealth during this time. During the emergency, telehealth coverage is permitted in broader circumstances and restrictions on geography and location have been temporarily lifted. Normally, telehealth and Medicare is only available in rural areas and under certain conditions, and the patient and the provider must be located in healthcare facilities just not in the same place. Uh, but the temporary policies in place now allow both provider and patient to conduct telehealth visits from their homes. Providers and patients also have more flexibility to use different types of technology than what is normally permissible. Medicare covered telehealth services are still subject to Part B deductibles and cost sharing, although providers may, but are not required to reduce or eliminate cost sharing for telehealth services. Medicare coverage of telehealth during the emergency is not limited to COVID-19 related services and is available to enrollees regardless of their diagnosis. Telehealth visits can include regular office visits, mental health counseling, and preventive health screenings. Medicare Advantage plans may expand telehealth access as well, but are not required to. And finally, we have private insurance. I'm going to talk about federal laws affecting private insurance during COVID-19, some state level policies and also insurer level policies. First, testing. Um, ACA compliant plans and group health plans must cover COVID-19 testing without cost sharing. They must also cover testing related services without cost sharing, but like with Medicare, there is an asterisk on that. The testing related services are only covered without cost sharing if um, the patient actually gets tested for COVID-19, if they don't actually get tested, for example, because the provider determines that it's not necessary, the visit to the provider and any services that were provided to uh, evaluate the patient for COVID-19 are subject to normal cost sharing under the patient's plan. For some plans, particularly plans with high deductibles, this can become quite costly. COVID-19 testing and test related services um, also must be covered if provided by an out of network provider. Uh, keep in mind, though, that services accessed from out-of-network providers might still be subject to balance billing, although the CMS has encouraged plans not to balance bill for out-of-network COVID testing and testing-related services. Insurers um, may not impose utilization management for COVID-19 testing and test-related services if they're accessed in-network. Uh, however, insurers can still impose cost-sharing and utilization management for COVID-19 treatment. Uh, treatment can therefore still be very costly, even if the testing and the testing related services are covered without cost sharing. Um, these protections apply only to ACA compliant plans. So this means that anyone enrolled in a non-ACA compliant product, like short term limited duration insurance or a healthcare sharing ministry, may still face very high costs for COVID-19 testing and related services.
<clears throat> I'm sure this is uh, very familiar to many of you, but I just wanted to provide a brief refresher on special enrollment periods or SEPs. An SEP allows consumers to change plans or enroll in ACA compliant coverage either on or off marketplace outside of the annual open enrollment period, which is November 1st to December 15th in most states. In order to be eligible for an SEP, the consumer must have experienced a qualifying life event. Here are some examples of qualifying life events. Events, It's not an exhaustive list. Uh, the first two are particularly relevant to the COVID-19 crisis since millions of people are expected to become unemployed or experience reductions in their income. So if someone uh, loses their job and therefore loses their coverage that they received through that job, they can apply for marketplace or off marketplace coverage through an SEP. The SEP begins 60 days before they lose their coverage and then 60 days after they lose their coverage. Consumers who miss this window will not be able to get ACA compliant coverage right now unless they qualify for an SEP for a different reason. According to the Urban Institute data that I mentioned earlier, as many as 10 million people could enroll in individual market plans if they lose their employer coverage due to COVID-19. So SEPs are going to be critical right now for a lot of people that need to get coverage. Keep in mind that although many people have access to COBRA coverage after they lose their jobs, they don't have to enroll in COBRA. COBRA can be very expensive for many people. So enrolling in ACA compliant coverage through an SEP is going to be a more affordable option in most cases. And the second SEP I wanted to highlight right now is the uh, change in income SEP. People who already have coverage without premium tax credits um, because their incomes are too high, but experience a drop in income that makes them newly eligible for tax credits can enroll or change their plan. Keep in mind that people who already have marketplace coverage will be limited to choosing a plan within the same metal level as their current plan, unless there are no plans in the same metal level available. And by metal level, I'm referring to you know, bronze, silver, gold, platinum tiers that we see in marketplace coverage. <clears throat> Even if someone already receives premium tax credits when their income is reduced, they can still update their marketplace application to see if they're eligible for a higher tax credit amount or for Medicaid. In addition to all the usual SEPs that are available year round, a number of states have created SEPs specifically to address uninsurance during COVID-19. Uninsured residents of the states listed here have um, a special opportunity to apply for health coverage right now. Each state has a different deadline, which I've listed here. Uh, some of them have already expired, as you can see, but um, many states still have this SEP available, some only for a very limited additional amount of time. And I forgot to cross off Colorado, my apologies. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, only states with state-run exchanges can implement this SEP, and all but Idaho have chosen to do so. People in Idaho and the 38 states uh, that use the federal exchange website, healthcare.gov, don't have this COVID-19 SEP available to them, but they can still enroll in coverage if they qualify for an SEP for any other reason. Um, since private insurance is regulated significantly on the state level, there are a lot of policies that states can choose to put in place that go beyond what's required under federal law. All the states indicated here in green have um, implemented, have imposed additional requirements for private insurance, such as additional cost sharing protections for COVID-19 testing and care, early medication refills, uh, telehealth expansion, relaxing prior authorization and network requirements, premium payment relief, and others. Um, by the way, Montana should also be green now. This map has changed since I made these slides, but I'm a little limited on the kind of changes I can make the last minute. So um, Montana, you are also green on this map. <clears throat> um, some other states have chosen not to go as far as requiring insurers to do these things, but have instead recommended that insurers do so. Um, your state's insurance department website should have information about policies that are in place in your state and insurance companies in your state can also provide information about these policies. Uh, insurance company policies. Believe it or not, some private insurance companies have actually chosen to expand coverage for COVID-19 related services beyond what's required under state or federal law. Many companies have also made other changes that enable access people to access non-COVID-19 related care and services safely. For example, by expanding telehealth, relaxing medication refill restrictions, expanding home deliveries for medications and other things. Clients should contact their insurance companies to learn about policies that are in place during the emergency. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, as you know, federal COVID-19 related legislation includes some funding to help people get through these difficult times. Uh, first, there is the stimulus payment. This is a tax-free one-time payment of up to $1,200 for single filers and $2,400 for married filers. Many people have already received it and some others may not have yet, but will. This payment will not be included in a person's income when they apply for Medicaid or marketplace coverage. And again, it's not taxable. Second, there is the enhanced unemployment benefits. This adds $600 per week to a person's existing unemployment benefits. This enhanced amount is currently set to expire on July 31st. Just like regular unemployment, this is taxable and it is included in marketplace income. But unlike regular unemployment, the $600 boost is not included in Medicaid income. Uh, the federal legislation also extends unemployment benefits by 13 weeks. Um, all but eight states already allow for 26 weeks of unemployment benefits per year. Um, there are eight states that allow for less than that. Uh, so this means that most people can get up to 39 weeks of unemployment benefits this year. But remember that the uh, unemployment benefits that are received after July 31st do not include the additional $600 per week. Um, after July 31st, people are eligible for their normal unemployment amount. Now, how does this impact ADAP financial eligibility? Uh, based on an informal survey that we conducted through our Part B ADAP listserv, which some of you might have responded to, thank you, um, the trend we're seeing is that states generally are not counting the one-time stimulus payments in ADAP financial eligibility determinations. Uh, for the enhanced unemployment benefits, uh, that $600 boost, most states that responded to my query indicated either that they're following Medicaid policies and not counting this as income or that they're still undecided. Only a couple of states definitively indicated that they plan to count the increased U uh, unemployment for ADAP financial eligibility purposes. So since I know that uh, many of you are interested in knowing how your fellow states are approaching this issue, um, we've included a brief poll for you all. So I'm going to launch it now. It's my um, first time doing this, so please bear with me. <clears throat> Okay, so now you should see a poll on your screen. Take a moment to um, select the answer that um, applies to you. Right. The numbers are still climbing here, so I'll give people a moment. <clears throat> oh, great. Lots of people responding. Thank you. Keep them coming, everyone. All right. Um, so we have a good number of responses already. I see some more trickling in, but as of right now, um, I don't know what you all see on your screen. I apologize. I don't know if you see the results, but um, what I'm seeing here is that overwhelming majority of uh, folks are responding that their state is not going to consider either type of income in um, ADAP eligibility. And um, it's about 75% and then almost 20% um, will be considering the uh, enhanced unemployment benefits Small number of states have said both. <clears throat> um, okay, so that's uh, really helpful. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm going to. Uh, sorry. Okay, I think it should be gone now. All right. Um, I think we should be back to the normal view. My apologies. <clears throat> Um, so now I want to switch gears a little bit, and I want to talk about ways in which um, Part B and ADAP programs can um, accommodate client needs during this time. So we've identified uh, three primary considerations for programs, um, and then I'll get into some details on the next couple slides about uh, policies that states are already implementing. Uh, first, it's important for programs to maintain effective policies for enrollment and recertification um, while protecting the health of both clients and staff. Uh, second, many clients, since many clients will likely lose their existing coverage that they received uh, through their employment, 
or experience changes in income that make them eligible for new types of coverage, it's really important for programs to be prepared to help clients uh, navigate their coverage options and transition smoothly to alternative coverage sources without experiencing disruptions in care. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, those staggering numbers from Urban Institute, um, that data shows that anywhere from 18 to 31 million people who lose their employer coverage during COVID-19 could enroll in Medicaid or marketplace coverage. And this estimate doesn't even include people who don't lose their coverage, but who experience a change in income that might make them eligible for a different kind of coverage. So being prepared to help clients transition to new coverage as seamlessly as possible right now is very important. And third, medication access. So this includes strategies for helping both full pay and uninsured clients access medication safely to uh, ensure uninterrupted treatment. And I'm sure all of, uh, you have all seen the extensive HRSA-HAB FAQs, uh, which are constantly being updated. I encourage everyone to check those regularly to help identify new strategies for serving clients during COVID-19. So here are some examples of policies that states have already implemented in their Part B and ADAP programs um, for medication access. Uh, availability of some of these options uh, to an individual client will depend on the jurisdiction and the client source of coverage. Uh, for streamlining enrollment and recertification, uh, we've seen states uh, implement policies such as extending deadlines, relaxing documentation requirements, allowing verbal or written self-attestation, uh, conducting enrollment and research by phone or electronically, um, and accepting verbal client consents. Um, client meetings and assessments can also be modified to allow for social distancing, for example, by extending deadlines, talking to clients on the phone rather than in person, um, waiving client signature requirements, uh, and using telehealth for routine visits and evaluations. Um, and then some other policies that we've seen include uh, increased uh, budget for support services. Um, it's not included in this slide right now, but um, HRSA has, re has released an FAQ document that includes examples of some ways in which uh, programs can leverage different service categories to support clients during this time. Um, we've also seen from states policies to accommodate incarcerated or recently incarcerated individuals. Um, and also policies, just an emphasis on insurance assessment and navigation for clients that lose coverage or have a change in income. So here's a list of some additional resources that might be helpful to you right now. Um, don't worry about saving these right now. We'll uh, circulate a slide deck and all of these will be included in the next couple of days. Um, NASTAD has uh, here at the top, the first one, I just wanted to draw attention to NASTAD's uh, COVID-19 resources page. We update this regularly. I encourage everyone to take a look and to revisit the page often. Um, second, the, contact on, the content on the previous couple of slides, uh, state policies, uh, have come from, came from information that you all shared with us. So thank you, and please continue to share. You can share resources by sending them directly to Mahalit, um, and you can access resources uh, through ONTAP. If you haven't set up ONTAP yet, you can check your uh, the listserv for an email with information about how to do that or uh, re uh, reach out to NASAD with questions. <clears throat> um, and then at the bottom of the list here is the ACA Center, which is a great resource as well. And that is a perfect segue to our next presenter. I'm going to hand it over to Lisa Liu from JSI to talk about some of their resources. Um, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Also, just a reminder to keep go ahead and send questions uh, through the chat feature in GoToWebinar, and we will um, address them after Liesl, Liesl's presentation. All right, Liesl, take it away. Great, thanks, Dory. You can hear me? Yes. Great, so um, hi, everyone. I'm Liesl Liu. I'm a product director for the ACTA Center and a senior consultant at JSI. And so happy to be here with you today. We just wanna highlight a few quick key messages um, for frontline staff that you can share with your subrecipients. We found that people are needing to refocus on the basics of the ACA right now, especially during a time of so much change and uncertainty. Um, many clients are losing coverage and it's important to remind case managers and benefit staff about how to help clients explore eligibility options through the marketplace, Medicaid, CHIP, and more. So um, it's helpful to contextualize the current environment for your subrecipients that many clients may be losing a job or having their hours reduced or experiencing income changes. And many of these life events and special circumstances create 
the marketplace special enrollment periods or SEPs that Dory's already presented on. So the loss of coverage SEP is critical in this case to helping clients enroll in new coverage and, um, and using the SEP mechanism to do that. And um, so I'm not gonna go into detail on those since uh, Dory already um, covered um, the basics of how, how those mechanisms work. As she mentioned also, there are a number of states that have created SEPs to promote access to private health insurance due to COVID-19. And in these states, anyone can enroll in or change coverage, even if they haven't experienced an, a qualifying life event. So it's important for frontline staff to also remind, remember these for those living in these states. Um, and depending on the state, the SEP may end in, in have already ended or be ending in May or June. Um, so those are critical as well during this time. And then Medicaid and CHIP enrollment is open throughout the year for newly eligible clients. In Medicaid expansion states, some clients may be newly eligible for Medicaid due to reduced income. And in clients who are turning 65 are eligible for Medicare coverage and should enroll in Medicare if they do not have employer coverage. And we've heard a lot that um, COBRA is being used and um, COBRA is an option out there too, but it can be more expensive and may not be the best fit for, your, for clients' coverage needs. So it's important to look at all the options before deciding to use coverage. And finally, and it's important to remember that the Ryan Wright program is not health insurance and um, it only covers HIV care and ADAPS can often help clients find affordable coverage for all their health needs. So this is a way to balance out coverage and, and, and help um, assist with payments. So you can go to the next slide. So we have a few tools um, from the ACA Center for Consumers uh, that frontline staff can use when they're meeting or speaking with um, consumers over the phone um, that support all of this messaging that I just went over and that Dory um, has been uh, covering today. So first is the special enrollment periods fact sheet is designed to remind Ryan White clients that there are certain life events or these special circumstances that allow people to enroll in or change private health insurance outside of open enrollment periods. So this fact sheet describes each life event or special circumstance. Um, it doesn't include the special state um, COVID-19 SEPs, but it goes into all the other ones um, and can help clients figure out uh, which one applies to them in order to uh, enroll or re-enroll. And then the next slide. The next resource is one um, that is called Stay Covered All Year Long. And here we specifically address what clients should do to avoid being dropped from their health coverage, um, especially right now. We um, don't want to have any additional folks losing coverage um, that more than needed. And so this re resource can help support conversations with clients to talk about the importance of paying premiums on time, why it's good to report income and household changes to the marketplace, um, and how to do that so that that can um, help in these circumstance circumstances. So they, um, Dory had chatted out a link to our tools at the beginning of the webinar, and you can find all of our resources um, on the link on the resources slide that Dory had just gone over. And I encourage you to subscribe to our email list from our homepage at targethiv.org forward slash ACE. We have been and we'll continue to put out emails and resources with plain language explanations on um, key healthcare access and health coverage issues that are occurring right now during um, the COVID-19 health emergency. So that is it. Back to you, Dory. Thanks. Thanks so much, Liesl. Um, so now we have time for some questions. And um, we have a few questions here, but I'm sure there must be more. Don't be shy. Feel free to send them to us. Um, so I have Tim here to help me facilitate Q&A. Tim, what do we have? Great, thanks, Dory. Uh, so first, we have a um, uh, more of a comment uh, from Cindy Berger um, in Oklahoma. Uh, that if a person um, has met their maximum out of pocket, um, uh, they may be more cost effective to actually enroll them in COBRA. Also, um, if uh, they are enrolled in a different marketplace plan, the maximum out of pocket is starts over, so it may not be cost effective to do so. So Dory, uh, let us know any comments you have on that. Yeah, Cindy, that is definitely correct. Thank you for flagging that. Um, I kind of made a general statement that COBRA is um, often not an affordable option for folks. Of course, it's very case by case. It depends on what options are available to the person, how far along they are in meeting their max out of pocket, like you said. Um, but one thing that is important to highlight though, because um, we get questions on this pretty often is that 
uh, just because COBRA is available does not mean someone has to enroll in it. So that is definitely something to keep in mind. <clears throat> Thanks, Cindy. Great, thanks, Tori. Okay, so we have a question from our Jimmy Borders in Arizona. So to clarify, when, if a client finds themselves disenrolled from Medicaid um, in an expanded Medicaid state, uh, they are to contact the Medicaid agency <clears throat> or CMS. Um, some states, uh, uh, Medicaid agencies do not handle um, enrollment, um, as that may be handled by a sister state agency or third party who is screening for additional program access above and beyond Medicaid, such as food stamps, um, WIC, et cetera. Um, yeah, thanks, Jimmy. Um, so, so first, the uh, the requirement on not disenrolling folks, um, like I said, it's only if the state's intending to pursue the federal enhanced federal match. So it's difficult to ascertain at this time which states are choosing to do that. Um, we expect a lot of states will because, like I said, Medicaid, um, a drastic expansion of Medicaid during or growth of the Medicaid program during a time like this can really strain state budgets. Um, but if your state is not is seeking the enhanced federal match, then this policy does not apply to them. Now, let's say the state is enhanced, isn't in pursuing the enhanced match, um, and someone is disenrolled from Medicaid after March 18th involuntarily. So not someone who chooses to disenroll, but the state disenrolls them involuntarily after March 18th. Um, they do not contact CMS in that situation. Um, person would contact their um, mate, their Medicaid agency, or if there is a, you know a sister state agency um, that's screening for <clears throat> um, that's handling en enrollment, then that might be a good place to start. Um, but um, I would say that contacting the state Medicaid agency is a good place to start because they can either handle the issue or they can direct you to, like Jimmy raised the a third party or other state agency that is um, that is handling enrollments and eligibility. But contacting the state Medicaid agency is the recommended first place to start if you're not sure um, what other agency might be appropriate. And that would be, uh, sorry, if the state is, is seeking the enhanced federal fund match and someone was disenrolled after March 18th, they were not supposed to be disenrolled, they should get reinstated and they can have their coverage retroactive back to the date that they were disenrolled. Great. Thank you very much, Dory. Now I actually have a question uh, either for you, Dory, or for Amy, um, who has joined us, uh, which is, has NASDAQ heard if HRSA will be relaxing the repayment um, for temporarily enrolled clients who happen to fall out of care requirement in PCN 1302, or will that requirement remain in effect and be subject to review action during a site visit? This is Amy, and hi everyone. Um, I, I I can answer that. I mean, for for right now, and and I, we would urge you to go to the um, the HERSA FAQs, uh, which are up on the the HERSA HAB COVID website. Um, uh, for right now, that that requirement is still in place, um, and there's been nothing altering the the PCNs that um, that require that. It's really a, a sort of basis of pair of last resort. Um, however, uh, I, I would say, you know, I I think um, in terms of policies and procedures to sort of get it right um, and to ensure um, that that there there aren't uh, overpayments um, or there aren't, excuse me, uh, sort of expenses that need to be uh, reimbursed or paid back. Please talk to NASDAQ. Um, I think as, as you know, we have been collecting uh, enrollment policies uh, uh, in, in this time um, that I think uh, are, are putting in place a lot of um, streamlined uh, solutions. So we are happy to talk with any jurisdictions for whom this is um, this is a problem, and we would urge you to continue to look at um, the HRSA HAB FAQ page. Great, thank you very much, Amy. Um, so we have no um, additional questions um, in the the queue. Uh, so at this point, we again we encourage everyone uh, with questions uh, to please um, write them in via the uh, the chat box, um, or uh, if you do have a question. Um, that you want to present to uh, you know to Dory, Amy, or even myself, um, please feel free to unmute yourself. It's hmm. great. Everyone, everyone's an expert now. <laughs> um, okay. Well, um, I 
think Tim, then if we don't have any other questions coming in, um, we can give folks back uh, the last 10 minutes here. If um, additional questions come up, uh, feel free to reach out to me, anyone here at NASAD, we are here available to help you. Like I said, keep on checking for um, our COVID-19 resource page. We'll be updating it regularly and um, slides and webinar recording will be made available soon. Thank you everyone and um, have a great rest of your day.